you know what, but we didn't want it. To, that's also Chicago's way. We didn't want to admit it. So she's the one. Uh, she's the one who was telling the world the Irish were subhuman. So. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, well. We are not amused. That was her famous quote too, wasn't it? Oh yeah, I think we are, so. We are, are not we are not amused. Huh? Yeah. Well, there's, but it's we, like there was no, there was no uh, uh, tomatoes in Italy for the. Uh, for the Italians for their pasta either until Columbus, Columbus. brought it over. Columbus, so right. Yeah. It's a new world. You know, yeah. Corn on the cob, lima beans, squash. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Turkeys. Turkeys, yeah. yeah. Turkeys. Yeah. Of course, yeah. of course they didn't shape. have alcohol or smallpox either, but they, they brought that uh, back. Well, getting on to the next subject, but prior to that time, before all these different crops were grown, you grew grain. Yeah. So how much grain would you have to grow to make these loaves of bread or whatever, and now all of a sudden you had all this variety of things that could feed people. Yeah. And matter of fact, for years, potatoes were considered indecent. Matter of fact, the word spud comes from Society for the Prevention of Unwholesome Diet. Did you know that? No. Spud, yes, yeah, it's, a, it's a, an anagram of that. Who it must be an old potatoes. Irish uh, idiom. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no it's just, yeah. There's even, I remember, I was seeing one of our art classes, the, the, the painting is called The Potato Eaters, yeah. like a bunch of low-life poor people. <laughs> sure. eating. Yeah. It Who was ate the first potato? And you know what? They were right. What? <laughs> Who were... ate the first potato that looked like a rock? Who? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, for someone to pick up a, a, a rock out of the ground and eat it, I don't know how they were. Yeah. Hmm. I read they a story. Were, they were hungry. The story was, was uh, they, they were trying to introduce the potatoes in Russia, and the peasants would not eat the potatoes because they thought it was poisonous. They thought if they were being told to eat this, there must be something must wrong be with it. Hungry. And they didn't know how they were going to get the peasants to eat potatoes. So finally, the Tsar had an idea. He issued an order. No one is permitted to eat potatoes except the aristocracy. Oh, yeah. Any peasant caught with a potato will be severely punished. They stationed guards around the potato fields. So then the peasants started sneaking yeah. into the potato yeah. field. They thought, yeah. this must be good. This yeah. must be good. Sure, because they're so, keeping us and, out. So then when they found out that they could eat them and, and nothing bad happened to them, then they were, then they were willing to... Uh, did, there wasn't the same thing with tomatoes for years. Tomatoes were uh, were till the twentieth century. Americans did not eat tomatoes. tomatoes. They were considered poison they, because they're related to the, the nightshade, nightshade or something. Yeah, the, well, the, the nightshade plant. They, they grew, they grew them in your yard everywhere. Oh, they grew yeah. them in gardens just as ornaments, just oh. as decorations. They that reminds me, you're talking about Russia. The Russian Olympic Committee is out there looking for uh, tryouts for their for the uh, track and field. So they had a field where they what they doing the hammer throw. So some of the athletes come up and they're doing it, and one, one goes astray and goes, sails over into the farmer's yard, you know. The guy working in the field gets up and he throws it back. <laughs> wow, what a toss. So they bring him over, and they say, try this. Have you ever done this before? No, they think it would be great. So they try it a few times. He says, that's really something. He says, well, that's nothing. You've got to see how far I can throw the sickle. <laughs> 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 That's actually Ronald Reagan used to tell that joke. Did he? Yeah. Are we ready for? Sickle, yeah. I heard it before him. So. Yeah. Are we ready for a break after that? Right. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> I know we're ready for one. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, well, Steve you mentioned grain. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in another thing. One, another one of the reasons that Chicago was able to revive so quickly was we were in the center of this enormous grain-producing area. There was really no rival, so that even even with the destruction that happened to the city, all the railroads con continued to to be hubbed in Chicago, and mm -hmm. the railroads weren't destroyed. The other thing was uh, the stockyards were not destroyed by the fire; they survived the fire. Uh, so there were some factories, some early you know factories had been put up outside the area where mm -hmm. the destruction was. So there were certain things that at least were saved: the railroads and the and the the stockyards. And that all contributed to the fact that Chicago revived as rapidly as it did. Yeah, we, we had 17 grain elevators at the, the time. Grain the grain elevators fire, survived, I don't too. think any of them were That's really right. destroyed. We were right. lucky we had General Sheridan up at... Uh, up at, up, uh, at, up at Belmont and Sheridan Road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he came down here with dynamite to stop that fire. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and with his troops, too. Yeah. He, he was the lieutenant the, general at the time. He yeah. was the second-ranking... Sherman yeah. Sherman had moved up to general. He was the four-star rank general of the army. Yeah. And Sheridan had taken. Then there was one three-star position. He was a lieutenant general. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't throw away. You see, uh, officers, uh, you know, testifying in before Congress. And there's a four-star guy. You never heard of him. In the old days, you knew every well from World War II. You knew every four-star, three-star general. You know, pictures were in the paper. And Grant yeah. had see, Grant had become the first three-star general in U.S. history since George Washington. 
Washington had been a lieutenant general. That was his official rank. Yeah. Yeah. And Grant was given that rank during the Civil War. Then he made full general. After the war, they oh, promoted boy. him to four stars. Wow. First, first officer first. in American history ever to have four, four stars. stars. When he became president, Sherman moved up to the four star rank, and Sheridan was a lieutenant general. Then when Sheridan re when Sherman retired, Sheridan was briefly a four star general. Wow. And then what happened to Peabody? Peabody and Sherman. <laughs> yeah, Peabody and, and then the, the rank ended with him. Uh, Here's one for you. Maybe someone can answer this one. How come a lieutenant general outranks a major general? Would you think it would be vice versa? There's a reason for it. Why? The major general was originally a sergeant major general. Mm. And the lieutenant general naturally outranks a sergeant major, sergeant major. was the highest okay. rank, highest enlisted rank. So they, the original rank of a, was sergeant major general and then lieutenant above. They, eventually the sergeant part was just dropped. Yeah. And that's why they're called well, major general. I now couldn't I even know. make it you over know. corporal. How Me and Hitler. <laughs> Hitler? Yeah. Um, we Napoleon couldn't even was make it over corporal. He was, Napoleon was a corporal too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and a general at 24. He yeah, he was, but like Napoleon that. rose through the ranks. He was yeah. a yeah. regimental colonel, became a general. But he was a, he had been a some, yeah. At some point early in his career he may have been a corporal, but yeah. uh, yeah. They used to call him the little corporal, but you know what PFC stands for, by the way, the real title. <laughs> what? Praying for corporal. <laughs> <laughs> Some say praying for civilian. <laughs> praying for civilian. On that happy note, we're taking another little break here. I'm going to throw it back to John Davila, the creator, producer, and uh, mentor of the show. And thank you very much, Jack. What a great uh, program we have going here today. We are broadcasting from uh, the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago here at 5218 South uh, Western Avenue in the city of Chicago. Today is Monday. It is the 10th day of October, and it's the year 2011 or 2011, whichever way you want to look at it. You know, at our first break, we had talked about um, your roof on your house. You want to make sure that you've got a good roof with the bad weather coming up. Uh, that's not a, not that far away. But also you have to remember your vehicle, and uh, you want to make sure that you got good tires on your on your car, your truck, your van, or whatever. You've got the antifreeze. You have uh, oil, motor oil, and uh, all kinds of stuff to keep your vehicle running and to be safe for the winter season, which is coming up. And you can do all that by stopping over at Berkeley Auto Supply Company, which is located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley. The uh, Tom is just east of Wolf Road and west of Mannheim Road in Berkeley on the west on the south side of the street. And whatever you need for your vehicle, uh, if it's the spark plugs, tires. Uh, whatever, whatever you need for your vehicle, Tom has got it uh, at Berkeley Auto Supply, which is located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley. His phone number is area code 708-544-8350. Tom's behind his counter Monday through Friday from 8 in the morning to 8 in the evening, Saturday from 8 until 6, and he's even there on Sundays from 10 to 3. So that's Berkeley Auto Supply, 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley. The phone number is 708-544-8350. And once again, whatever you need for your vehicle, from bumper to bumper, from rear bumper to front bumper, from the top of the roof to the bottom of, of, the, uh, uh, of the chassis, Tom has got it. And once again, Best Brothers Roofing, fifth, uh, give Mike Besh a call for a new roof on your house or for repairs or for every, whatever you need. Uh, give uh, Mike Besh, area code 630-616-1359. And you're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Uh, we're, we're live from the... Fire Museum of Greater Chicago at uh, 5218 South uh, Western Avenue in uh, Chicago. And um, 
Well, I see uh, my uh, my experts are, uh, when they said they're going to take a break, they took a break. So uh, we'll be uh, back in just uh, just a second. And once again, we are broadcasting from the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. And I just want to tell you, gentlemen, that we have uh, in our audience here today, we have uh, two people that are uh, very dedicated to our show. Uh, first of all, the gentleman who provides us with the music, uh, the Chicago, which we just heard just a second ago, was Ron Smolin. Uh, Ron is a quite the great orchestra leader. Uh, last Sunday, I was uh, at the Stardust uh, Banquet Facilities, and from 2 until 5.30, man, I tell you, I had tears in my eyes from the great music that Ron was playing. So, Ron, thank you very much for uh, for the music and uh, and all your support that you have given us. And also, we have, uh, sitting right alongside of me here, is Terry Hodges, a very, very, very dear friend of mine. And uh, Terry had given me a little note here that uh, my grandfather was on the Chicago Fire Department from eight, uh, 1918 until 1952, and he retired as a captain. So uh, uh, the fire is in our blood here, I guess, huh, Jack? Very good. I had an Uncle Gene who died uh, as a young man. He was about 47 years old in 1973, if anyone knew him. He had 12 kids. <laughs> he was uh, my dad's youngest brother. and. Uh, I have very fond memories of him. So, his son is now the uh, Ed Ryan is a uh, battalion chief now. So, Where at? I'm not sure. Oh. So, so. I mean, what Chicago Fire? Yeah, oh yeah, Chicago. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Where else? So anyway, here we are back, folks. Uh, we're going to keep this discussion going. We got uh, some time yet, and uh, I know you can't call us in, so I'm not going to ask you to. I'm not going to give the phone number either. So it won't do any good. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> So, where were we, folks? Anywhere uh, particular? We're talking about films. We're talking about Columbus. We're talking about Columbus. Fires. Columbus. You Christopher are. Columbus. I'm going to ask uh, Ken Little to give us the history of the statue we have in the back of the museum, yeah. which is one of a kind, yeah. and which the sons of Italy would just love to get their hands on. And, Ken? And uh, <clears throat> we were very, very fortunate to get it. The history goes back to the Columbian Exposition uh, of 1893 held in Jackson Park and along Midway Plaisance. And um, one of the buildings that was erected for the fair was called the Coal Storage Building. <clears throat> it was on the uh, fairgrounds east side of Stony Island about opposite 64th Street. And its purpose was to hold uh, fruits and vegetables and anything that was uh, perishable. So it was a coal storage building. But the um, uh, architects and the people running the fair said, why don't we also turn it into an ice skating rink since we have the coal there? So uh, there was an ice skating rink. And the uh, building was uh, like uh, maybe two stories equal to four. So it had a big, tall roof. But then to uh, make it uh, sort of artistic, it, it had a long, tall smokestack, so they covered it. You know, they wanted to make it attractive. Well, uh, in July, I think it was July 10th, 1893, the fair is going on. It's around noontime, a little bit after noon. Smoke starts to come out of the, uh, alongside the chimney, etc. And there's evidently a fire in the building. And uh, the fire department uh, it turns out that there was a stairway alongside the, the uh, chimney, and the firemen start up the um, the stairway to see what's burning at the top, and when they get up there, they find the fire is actually at the roof level. It's at the base of the tower, not the top of the tower, and they've got, a, I don't know, some 20 firemen in the tower, and uh, eventually it burns, and they can't get out. Some jump, some, some uh, slide the hose, some slide ropes, but a bunch of them uh, went down with the tower. And uh, the uh, couple of, of things there, first of all, the pictures were taken, photos were taken of the fire. And they estimate about 100,000 people witnessed the fire because there were that many people in the, in the uh, uh, fairgrounds. 